Truck is XTV on air. We are now live in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of the Ace Attorney Chronicles. In the previous episode, we completed part one of the trial. Today's episode right now, we're going to get into part one or part two. Oh, whatever. Today's episode right now, we're bringing in another, a third witness that was not there at the scene of the crime. That was there at the scene of the crime, but is not here at the trial. If you have today's episode, make sure that like button is to the channel. Ah, uh, Gina, how are you holding up? I'm starting to feel quiet, warmly towards her frequent cold shoulders now. Gina, are you alright? Why aren't you saying anything? What's the point, eh? Why go all to the trouble and fight so hard for the likes of me? What? You saw it, the picture. What picture? Ah, you mean this? That photograph taken by Hurley's recorder? Well, hey, yo! That's what I thought. Well, I didn't think it would have captured a scene like this time, that's for sure. It's hopeless. Anyone who sees that, God's gonna think I did it, ain't it? Well, I won't pretend it wasn't a bit of shock when the prosecution first presented to the court. Surely you gotta have your doubts about me now. Of course I can. Hmm. Genie, why don't you talk to us? Tell us what happened that night. Runos cleverly managed to piece together on new information, but still, we we really like to hear from you. All right then. It was weed. It was after a weed ha had that dinner together at your place at Right Ivers. Then we all have chat up in your office, didn't we? Yeah, I remember. After that, I just couldn't get to sleep, so I slipped down and went down the street to the 2 to 1, the Windy Banks place I had to know if Iris' story was there or not, the Hound of the Baskerfields. I don't know what's about or nothing, but if you ask me, there's something in it that Sean don't like, something we don't want people reading. So that's why we lied to Iris. Sticking in lug with Woody Big for safekeeping. At least that's what I thought at the time. So you broke into Windy Banks? I just had to know if that it was there or not. I mean I had no idea all that was gonna kick off, did I? I struck the lock and snuck inside. It was dark as you like in there. So I gave the oil lamp on the counter a bit old wick and that's when what do you think you're doing? I nearly died. I did. And the next thing I knew... I grabbed the gun off the counter and was waving it in the air like I don't want it. And I don't know what. Ah, uh, oh, you're the girl who was in the in this afternoon. I didn't think pickpockets went in the armed robbery. The, the, the mental script. I hear you got it, eh? Did Shams leave an old little paper with you, a story? I beg your pardon? The Hound of the something or other. If it's here, I want to see it. I'm sorry, young lady. But I sooner, I'd sooner die than relinquish an article belonging to one of my customers. I don't want it. What I would want is with it anyway. I just want to see if it's here, that's all. Oh, you want to see it, do you? I want to know if Sean's really pawned here or not. Please, just let me see it. I'll go. 
Oh, very well then. But for pity's sake, stop waving my gun around, would you? So then the old Kelv unlocked the storeroom door and we both went inside. And it was there, alright. The mantle script. Shones were, weren't lying after all. You did all that just to check for me, Ginny? Anyway, then there was a bit of a kick up out in the main middle of the shop. The skulk. Skulking birds are running the scene, yes. What was the noise? Someone's breaking in! Dear me, is there some burglars convention here tonight that I don't know about? I think I forgot to shut the door behind me. Sorry. I better go and take care of it. Could I possibly have my gun back? Oh, well, I'll come with you, and Now, don't be foolish, young girl. You must stay right here. Don't leave this room under any circumstance. And with that, he took the gun out of me hands and walked back out into the shop. I have hung back in the door starting room like he said, staring me ears in the dark to the ear with what was going on. So they got into a big of a scrap. I started to think I could help I should help, see? So I was just about to open the store room myself when Bang bang. I heard a couple of shots go off. Two, I think. Almost at the same time. And then there he was, right at my feet, lying face down on the floor. I was right next to the storm door, so I slammed it shut and locked it like it was quick as like. Because you thought whoever had shot Mr. Winniebag might come after you. Yeah, so I went to grab the old gold's cud. I figured I'd put up a fight at least. But when I got a better look at him, I knew. Windy Bank was a gun. I felt funny in the head all of a sudden, kind of dizzy, and after that, I don't remember nothing. It must be when you passed out, Gina. If if I hadn't done what I want done, the old cove might still be alive. Did you tell the police everything you just told us? Of course I did, but they didn't believe a word of it, did they? All they said was, if I kept telling lies, I'd make things even worse for me. It'll be all right, Genie. Don't worry. Just stay strong a little longer. Runa's about to put the real culprit through the mill. That cove, what was there in the afternoon? That Eggerbird Benedict? Eggert. I still remember how he looked at me like I was something nothing. He was there that night. We don't know his real name yet. I'm convinced that he's involved somehow. Anyway, thank you for telling us what happened, Gina. I appreciate your help, honestly. Yeah, you what? We can leave the rest in Runo's capable hands now, Genie. Mr. Nara Odo? Yes? How come you trust me? I don't get it. I mean, have you forgotten what happened here before? Come on, it was only two months ago. Me and McGilded, we told you a whole pack of lies. And you got the bog trotter with him, even though I was the killer. No, I could never forget that. Oh, I did what I thought was best at the time, but the pain of the error of judgment doesn't get any easier to bear. Still, don't forget that I also made you a promise. I told you that I'd be on your side to the bitter end, no matter what. But what if I'm lying? You could be working to get another killer off the hook for all you know. I was once in your position, Gina. I was the accuser in the trial. You were? Before I left Japan, I was accused of a murder. And strange as it might sound, the circumstances of the crime were pretty damning. I was sure that no one would believe me. It was, it was me who'd done it. Oh, Runo. 
But there was one person who stood up for me, who believed in me, and was prepared to defend me. My best friend. Ryosuke, no one believes in you more than I do. Leave this to me. All you need to do is put your faith in me and I'll do the rest. I was so happy, I cried. But even then, somewhere inside me, I couldn't help thinking. Surely he doesn't really believe in me. Not completely. But... I was wrong. As soon as my trial began, it was obvious that he had an absolute unwavering belief in me. And in turn, I developed an absolute unwavering belief in him. Since then, I came to realize if you want someone to believe in you, you have to believe in the other person first. What are you saying? I promise you, Gina, that no matter what happens, I'll keep believing in you. So you don't need to worry. I won't let you down. Even though I'm a diver and a no-good liar, you're not like McGilded. I know that. I'm a sneeze. Eh? That's right, you're our friend, Genie. I, Iris, we know you're better than you think. And we've come to the conclusion that you're someone we can trust. Yes. That's really all we need to know. Exactly. Um, Mr. Naro Odo, um, I... Defendant, General Australian, her legal representation, whatever. Court proceedings are about to resume. Please head to the courtroom immediately. Yes, of course. Thank you. I've been both a defendant and defending lawyer in my time. So I knew only too well just how hard it was to pull all your faith in another. And I also knew just how hard it was to bear the burden of another, putting all their faith in you. This is at this is it at last, the final chapter, the final battle. Wish me luck, Sasato san. And I hope you're watching over me too, partner. I hereby call this court to order as soon as we resume the trial to Miss Lugina Lestrade. Lord Von Zarks, have you successfully subpoenaed the witness? The subpoena was delivered to the communication station where the man works immediately, my lord. However, the heavy rain was delayed the arrival of his carriage, it would seem. Uh, I see. Then let us turn our attention to the Inspector Griggs and precise on the case heard by the court this morning. The glowing omission of the third bullet in your report is a serious blunder, Inspector. Yes, um, I, I apologize, my lord. But although the defense chemicals analysis of blood at the scene makes more a compelling argument, I cannot permit such untried methods to be used as evidence in my courtroom. Huh! It's a big mistake to cross Hurley and me. A very big mistake. But the good now. My lord, the subpoenaed witness has just arrived in the building. Thank you, officer. Jump to the stand without delay. Mr. Edgar Benedict. I didn't expect to be crossing paths with him again so soon. Sooner than like this. Thank you for complying with the court subpoena at such short notice, sir. But of course, my lord, as an upstanding member of the London Society, it's my touch to oblige. Now, kindly state your name and occupation for the record. Ashley Grada. <laughs> Why is the name Ashley Gradon? Communication officer. Mr. Grada and I both work at London Central Communication Station. Now, perhaps somebody would kindly explain what all of this is about. 
You were apprised of the situation by the court officer on your way here, I presume? Yes, I was. Something to do with a murder that took place at a pawnbroker's on Baker Street? And some nonsense about me having been there on the night in question? That is the ac accusation indeed. This really is beyond a joke, you know. Very well, without further delay, the court will hear your testimony now, Mr. Graydon. You will now respond to the accusation made against you under oath. Gladly, my lord, gladly. The accusation. Naturally, I have occasion to make use of pawnbroking services from time to time. But you, are you seriously suggesting I colluded with these thugs to break into a place on the night of murder? I have no intention of admitting to such an outrageous accusation, even if certain parties have present claims that my blood was found at the scene. Some scaramouth detective's home brewed tincture can hardly be taken as serious evidence. I think this is something I had to press all. Do you deny the accusation completely, do you? I must say, I am dismayed. With the highest court in the land to be swayed by this self professed detective toy? It was the will of the jury, and our great British justice system demands that the jury will appeal. Then it would seem we have the misfortune of almost an empty assembly of jurors today. By golly! How long am I expected to be detained here? If following the first cross examination, your involvement is the matter has not established. You will be free to leave immediately. Good, then I shall be away for the time afternoon tea, so some consolation at least. Let us not hold up Mr. Graham any longer than necessary counsel and proceed with the cross examination. So we meet again, Mr. Edgar Benedict. Or is it Mr. Graydon? My apologies, you are... Ryunosuke Naruhodo, defense lawyer, we have met. If you say so, Ashley Graydon, enchanté. So... He took off his hat! I trust we can conclude this quickly. Uh, but I'm not holding your flashy hat while we do. He took off his hat. He's serious. He's serious. Naturally, I have to make use of pawnbroking service from time to time. Yes, we even met in the very pawnbrokery where the crime took place on the afternoon day in question. Though, of course. You introduced yourself by a different name at the time. It was Mr. Eggard Benedict, I believe. Uh, tell me. The witness here is testifying about events that took place that night. He is under no obligation to answer such unrelated questions. You can't be serious. Thank you, because I certainly do not feel inclined to answer such inappropriate question. So he's going to be very evasive, eh? An effort to not give me anything, eh? This could be tricky. What are you seriously suggesting I colluded with these thugs to break into a place on the night of the murder? Have you seen these two men before? This pair? No, I don't associate with criminals. Said by a man who introduced himself as Edgar Benedict. I'd like to know who I have to thank for this. Who made this outlandish accusation against me? The young lawyer there in the black. This is a farce! Whose idea was it to permit an outsider to work in the British court anyway? Well, needless to say. I have no intention of admitting to such a great accusation. You're under oath! Where were you around 1 in the morning on the night in question, sir? That is past the hour at which I would normally retire. Certainly. I was not in the company of these rough scallions. You're able to prove that? Objection! Listen carefully, my learned Nipponese friend. Or you appear to be under a gross misapprehension on this point. What do you mean? 
The witness maintains he was not at the scene of the crime. He, was, he has no obligation to prove his absence. If your accusation is that the witness was present at the scene, the obligation lies with you to prove your assertion. You will fulfill that obligation before putting any more unreasonable questions to the witness. Yeah, I think that's a hint right there. A silent victory wiggle. Thanks. Even if certain parties present claim that my blood was found at the scene. It. I pressed L2, didn't I? LZ? Blood was found at the scene of the crime. There's no question to that. Mr. Sharp's chemical analysis has positively identified the substance as such. But I am not only human to have blood running through my veins, am I? How can you be sure the blood is mine? It could equally be the blood of one of these two miscreants. Every individual's blood was slightly different on composition, it seems. But Mr. Sholm's chemical is able to differentiate different. Spare me the science lesson. Who is the Sholm's character anyway? Oh, I assume all Londoners would know the name. He's a great, well, a renowned detective. So even you are unable to bring yourself to say great detective. A great detective, you say? <laughs> now we're in the realm of fairy tales, are we? Hold it! Excuse me! Do you have something to say about that, Mr. Skulkin? Uh, what, me? No, the Mr. Skulkin next to you. Right, I've had it up to with this. How many times I've got to tell you? Yes, I know, you're not big brub sulky. Mr. Nash Skulkin. Uh, cold blimey, governor. You what? Is it not the case that when Mr. Graydon just spoke, I thought went through your mind? Would you care to share that thought with the court? Uh, me thoughts? I thought none of them. I must have been it. You what? Mr. Nash Skulkin, answer the question, please. What went through your mind when Mr. Graydon just spoke? Nothing. Honest, God, nothing. I was just thinking. If waves his arm around like that much more, it'll open up the wound again, that's all. What wound? What? Where he took the bullet, of course. It was only two days ago. It ain't gonna be healed up yet. So I was, uh, well, you know, I was worrying for him, and... Why? Oh, hell, well, spells, whatever, I don't want to be saying. Mr. Graydon, did you hear that? What? Your comrade is worried about you, it seems. On account of your injured arm. My lord? Yes, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two wretches are talking about. Certainly, I shouldn't be expected to answer anything in relation to their mindless insulations. <sighs> we know that someone other than the victim was hit by a bullet at the scene of the crime two nights ago. And from the height of the bullet in the wall, that person was likely in the upper arm or thereabouts. Perhaps you allow a court official to examine your arm, sir? The left arm that you use currently clasping with your right arm as if it pains? No, I refuse. You have shown no evidence whatsoever that links me to these common thieves. Accordingly, I am not obliged to permit any such invasion of my privacy. He pleads the fifth. But this is UK laws. As I've already said, I'm completely uninvolved in all of this. I never had anything to do with the pawn brokery where this fellow was killed whatsoever. I take offense at this insinuation that I was in any way involved. <sighs> you claim to have had nothing whatsoever to do with Mr. Wendy Bakes. Program. My lord! The fence would like to last statement to be added to Mr. Graydon's formal testimony. Very well, counsel. Continue with your testimony. Like I said before, that every time I try to do this, it's like I go left to right, and it takes a while for me to find the point that I'm trying to make. But. But, if I try to find the point that I'm guessing what I'm trying to make, I don't find it. It takes longer just to find it. Where were we at? 
Some Skyrim mounts attack pump and skinship, blah, blah, blah. Bottom line is I never had nothing to do with pump roping. Some scatter. Yeah, bottom line is I have never had anything to do with. Hold it! Never had anything to do with it. You forget that I was there, Mr. Graydon, on the very afternoon of the incident. Obviously, I am not a complete stranger to the pawnbrokers. I'm currently on the lookout for an armchair to furnish my study. No, you were there to redeem an article. I have no idea what you're talking about. Hold it! Do you have something to add, Inspector? Uh, come again, Sunshine! You were there too, in fact, weren't you, Inspector? That afternoon. Well, yes, I do remember meeting yourself in the pawnbroker that afternoon. You, your young Japanese assistant, and the accused were all present, as I recall. And at the time, the witness, Mr. Graydon, was trying to acquire a particular article. Didn't he run away? Uh, well, now... I'm afraid I don't remember too clearly. What? But we must. I'm not going to lie and pretend I remember something that I don't. What's going on here? Gregsy shows us a picture before, didn't he? You know from the cameras that Hurley installed in the money base? Yes, of course. Indeed, and the gentleman picture bears a striking resemblance to the witness, I must say. Exactly, which proves that Mr. Graydon was in the shop in the afternoon in question. At no point have I denied that fact. I merely entered the shop to pursue the articles on sale and have a war with the broker. Nothing more. This makes no sense. I understand why Mr. Graydon might be trying to cover his tracks. But why would Gregson be trying to avoid giving testimony about what happened? That's all he's going to say in the matter, is it? What do you think, Runo? I think he has no intention of telling us anything. Well, he's aware that the less he says, the less chance he has giving himself away. Hmm... The complete opposite of Hurley, then. He seems to think that more than he says. Well, at least I managed to prize a little more information from the witness's lips. All thanks to the Skulkin brothers. Yes, they were the key after all. So he says he had nothing to do with the Windy Banks. Well, we know that's not true. Perhaps now would be a good time to have a proper look at through the record record. Good idea. You never know what tiny scrap of information could be a valuable weapon. So he says that he was not there. What do we have in possession? Folia, statement, palm broker's ticket. Oh, the ticket. There's a ticket issued for the palm broker on the blood book. The blood on it is identified as Mr. Mason's. No, it's collected a while ago. Today's the newspaper which contains the article. I'll plus the report. Not that, not that. Crime scene floor plan, Winnie Banks, Skulk and Brothers, Ford Regina, Ford Shooting Photograph, Stereoscope, Metal Dusk, Sean's Pouch, Third Bullet. Where's the third photo? Hold it! Don't forget that, sir, that Mr. Herlock Chum is the most famous detective in the world. And the most detective in the world tells the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Hmm? Uh, well, um... Oh no, I can't think how to answer that. I once saw the world's most famous swindler thrown into jail. He allegedly told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but what turned out to be a pack of lies. Uh, quite. Now, as you are no doubt aware, the Central Communication Station is the heart of the country's information network. My work there is of paramount importance, and you have kept me from long enough already. The bottom line is I never had to do with what I established. Okay, I had to show something, something in the court record. I have no idea what. My option is this. But I was gone the moment he arrived. I need the other photo, which they didn't give us. 
I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm literally lost for words. I need a hint. Hold it. Tell me again what I need to do. Wait, isn't that the same thing that I just answered right now? I mean, press. Bottom line is, blah, blah. Never had to do anything with it. Objection. And that was the thing. And I had to press is idea. Right? What was that again? Then he's covering up something, but what? I'm assuming it's a disc, but what? Is he talking about a particular article? That we're not supposed to add to the collection? That's the only thing I can think of. He was there said day. But they didn't give us as evidence. That's all he's going to say. I actually have vocation to make use of working service from time to time. Can I- can we see what's the back of this? We know it's for him, but... Is there anything that's like... We can rip it off for? Cause I'm drawing blanks right now. Not gonna lie, Chief. Not gonna lie. I have no idea where I'm going with it. It's a baseless accusation. I'm gonna make three guesses. Guess number one. Guess number one, right now. Objection. That's a guess. Because I have no idea what I'm trying to figure out here. I've done good so far. I even have wild guesses that came out right. But at this point, I have no idea what I'm using, going against. Because I've read it, I said it, but it's not clicking. Objection. One of the blood is the portfolio is one that matches your blood exactly. That actually worked? My learned friend is free to analyze the evidence in any way he sees fit, but the court is free to discover the results. Meaning, as I have said to many times already, this detective's playing thing has no sway in the courtroom, and his lordship has ruled accordingly on the matter. Right! This will not do, counsel. The jury will discard the so-called evidence. Mr. Graydon, please continue with your testimony. We didn't get penalized. He was definitely there at the scene that night. Just have to find another way of proving it. We didn't get penalized for it? Interesting. The bottom line is I've never had anything to do with a palm broken establishment where the man was killed. Okay, why not the thing that I was thinking of then? Objection. I had the idea, but not the not the right one. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Have you ever seen this disc before, Mr. Graydon? Why? Is it supposed to mean something? This disc was until the day of the murder and pawn in Mr. Wendy's bank shop. It was redeemed by the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, in the afternoon. However, somebody mysteriously appeared to try to take it from her. And that somebody was you, of course, wasn't it, Mr. Graydon? As I have reiterated numerous times now, you are mistaken. That was not me. I've never seen that disc before in my life. It may have escaped during your notice, but there's a small smear of blood on the disc. 
Oh, uh, yes, resulting from an abrasion of the thumb, perhaps. That's right. The surface of the disc is covered in the hundreds of tiny metal bumps. In the skirmish to acquire the disc, the thumb of the person who tried to take it suffered a minor lacerations. So, while the disc bears the remnants of the skirmish in the form of his smear of blood, the thumb of the person in question must bear the remnants also in the form of a scratch. Good gracious, indeed it must. Mr. Graydon? You are refused to allow the court officer to examine your arm before. Are you now going to refuse to allow us to examine your thumb? Because I have no doubt that it bears a small scratch consistent of a small smear of blood on the disc. Well... It would seem I underestimate you. What? What's the meaning of this? So you admit it now? You admit you have a scratch on your thumb for when you attempt to take the disc from the defendant. I messed up. From the defendant. Order! Well, Mr. Graydon? It would appear there has been something of a misunderstanding here. I did not attempt to take the disc, as you put it. No, quite the reverse. What are you trying to say? It's really quite simple, you see. The disc was mine from the outset. Is there some crime taking an item that you own out of the pond? What? It would seem, Mr. Graydon. That in this piece of evidence, my learned friend has established a link between yourself and the incident. Accordingly, you will tell the court everything you know about this disc now. As you wish. Though I'm quite sure it has nothing to do whatsoever to do with the pawnbroker's murder. We'll get there, we'll get there. The disc. There is a note on the disc saying for Mr. For McGill, but the item belongs to me. The redemption ticket was stolen from me for the, by the accused, the, filter, the filthy guttling on the day in question. I proceeded at once to shop in order to explain my situation and redeem my article. In the end, of course, the disc was taken by the police. In other words, I had absolutely no reason to break into the shop later that night. But you stated there was a second disc that we don't know about. Did I hear correctly, sir? McGiddled, you say the famous Lon London philanthropist? Thrumpus. Who perished in this very courtroom two months ago about being acquainted of the distinctly messy murder? Yes, my lord, the one and the same. Good lord, Mr. Graydon! Are you saying that Mr. McGiddle and yourself were acquainted? Yes, that's correct. Order! Well, I certainly didn't expect to hear that name under here in the courtroom again. According to what Gina told us, this disc was placed in a pond of the fateful night two months ago. McGiddle himself gave instructions to deposit at Wendy's bank. It's funny that Mr. Graydon here is claiming the disc belongs to him, then, isn't it? In all likelihood, he's lying. So he appeared that afternoon at Wendy Bakes in order to get his hands on McGiddle's disc for some reason. Counsel, you will commence your cross-examination, please. Cross-examination. The disc. There's no saying for McGill, but the item belongs to me. Why? Would you care to explain how this belongs to you? As you will observe, a communications officer such as myself commands a fine salary. You are certainly exquisitely dressed, sir. You, so you see, I have little need to make use of services provided by pawn brokery trade. However, I did once find myself in difficulties having misplaced my purse while it's on the errand. You were a purse? Which is why I pawned my fine black overcoat to the broker in question. You claim that was your overcoat? Obviously, and in my haste I clean forgot. But the music box disc was in its pocket. And yet, there's a note on the that reads for McGildled. I am a collector of rare, unusual musical box musics. I first met Mr. McGill at a gentleman's club in the city and was interested to discover that he shared my pension in that area. So, the disc in question. It's a pre production sample. I promise to let Mr. McGill hear it. But then you forgot that it was in the pocket of the overcoat you were forced to pawn? Yes, exactly. Gina didn't mention any of that in her testimony two months ago, did she? No, because Mr. McGill had threatened her to keep her mouth shut. Which means that if we dig too deeply here, it's going to expose Gina's perjury. 
Oh dear, this is complicated, isn't it? Let's leave it alone for the time being. Damn it. I can't use that. It was someone for me, but they accused the filthy gullying on the day in question. I proceeded at once to the shop in order to explain my situation and redeem my article. In the end, of course, this was taken by the police. In other words, I have absolutely no reason to break into the shop later the same Hi! night. But perhaps you've seen something of value among the forfeited items. No, not at all. Oh? A value has was brought by, and by the police to assess everything in the shop. Without exception, every article in the shop was common or garden brick a brick. In that case, it's clear that you broke into the shop later that day in order to recover McGill's disc. Have you not been listening, man? Even if I wanted to recover the disc, you may recall that I had been seized by the police that afternoon. It was no more than in the shop that, ne that night than I, as I keep saying, I simply had no reason to break in. So there was nothing of Megiddo's left in the shop that night? Nothing this man might have been after? I wonder if that's really true. Bruno, if you have some evidence, then let him have it. I'm dying to see what that irritating a certain expression on his crumble. Uh, Megiddo slipped the disc into his coat pocket and deposited it in Winnie Banks. Then, when he realized he was going to be arrested on suspicion of omnibus murder, he threatened Gina and forced her to take the redemption ticket. There's no doubt about it. That witness is lying through his pearly white teeth. The police were obviously after anything left behind by Miguel as well. That's why Inspector Grayson ended up taking the disc into custody that day. But Grayson is being very strange about all this. There must be a reason for that, I'm sure. I just don't know what it is. For now, I need to focus on exposing the fact that Mr. Grayson is lying in the testimony. A rendition was told by a question. Hold it! So you're saying that Ms. Lestray lifted the ticket from your pocket or bag? That's right, despite being mindful of danger when walking in the insalubrious areas, where kept kind frequent. Ms. Lestray did no such thing! Well, of course you would take the stance of the girl is a regular offender. You came to the pawn brokering that day prepared with all information you need to identify the defendant. You were looking for her, that's what brought you to Winnie Banks. To get your hands on McGillard's disc. Objection. My learned friend is a veritable fawn of nonsense. Nonsense? I concur with the prosecution. Counsel, you will refrain from conjecturing in this way. Is that clear? Yes, my lord. Then I will continue with my testimony. I'm a sneeze. I want to shop in order to explain my. What do we got? What was this? And it was the one small box. Oh, this one. Hold up. I got it now. Hold up. I got it now. Hold up. You got an idea. We never found the box, did we? Hold it. Objection. The disc was deposited at Wendy Bakes at Max McGillis' instructions. You knew that, and you went there with the intention of obtaining for it yourself. Objection. Conjecture again. In any case, the disc was taken into custody by the police that afternoon. The witness has no reason to visit the pawn brokery again that Objection. night. <clears throat> Sorry, my learned friend. But that's not true. What? McGilded had another article in Pawn at Windy Banks, as this second pawnbroker's ticket proves. There were two articles belonging to Mr. McGilded in the Windy Banks pawnbrokery, and the reason you broke into the shop that night was to recover the second one. Together with your two accomplices, the Skulkin Brothers. <clears> hmm, <throat> this is the second ticket, is it? What had the man deposited? The article description reads, one small box. A rather vague description, it seems to me. Are you suggesting that I broke into the pawn brokery with these clowns in order to steal some trinket box? I believe there are adequate grounds to suspect that you did. This is absurd. Why on earth would I do such a thing? 
Once the article had been forfeited, I could simply walk into the shop and purchase it. There would be absolutely no need for me to resort to theft. That's a good point. Uh, indeed. The witness makes a solid argument. So that means that for some reason, this Graydon fellow needed a small box that very night, does it? Objection! It's time to put an end to this nonsense, my lord. Could you be a little cryptic, less cryptic, Lauren von Zykes? I do hate to ruin my learned friend's argument, but the truth is quite incontrovertible. On the night in question, no small box was taken from Wendy Bank's pawn brokery. And rest assured, the prosecution can prove it. They have it? Good gracious! Inspector, show the photographic print to the court if you please. Yes, sir. What prints? These prints were taken from the one of the detective security cameras. Ah, I heard these red-headed recorders again. As previously explained, using the plan of the shop layout. <clears throat> the victim's establishment was furnished with automatic cameras in two locations. One was set to capture the counter where Mr. Wendy Biggs received his customers, and the other was set to capture the shelves on which articles were placed for sale once forfeited. According to the information the ticket, McGiddle's small box has been forfeited already, two days before the incident at 9 p.m. on 13 April to be precise, which means it would have been on the shelves of forfeited items in the shop front. Now, what I have here is a print taken by one of the cameras about two hours before the incident, at 11 p.m. on 15 April. Uh, the victim certainly had a very full shop, it would appear. And then, here we have another print. I have no idea what the box looks like. This was taken after two hours after the incident. I see, so we have two pictures to compare. What am I looking at, Chief? Though I must say, placing side by side leaves me cold. I see nothing. But we can do the thing. Hear yeah, me, that's starting to make my headache. Obviously, at Scotland Yard, we consider theft as one possible motive in the case. We explore the possibility that something has been taken in addition to the victim's life. So you men have already compared these two prints thoroughly, Inspector? Yes, sir. We counted every single item in each of the store, two photographic prints. And the, Scot the Yard's conclusion is that exactly the same number are present in both. <sighs> in other words, nothing was taken from the pawn broker in the night in question, and my learned friend's assertion is nothing more than a hopeful fantasy. Ah! I don't believe it. Can we have those as evidence, please? If I could just have shown them he stole McGillis' pawn box. I, I might have be able to break him down at last. You know what, Runo? I've been thinking. We're gonna do the thing? One of these two photographs really are exactly the same. I can't even tell. What? So, counsel, in the light of the evidence put forward by the prosecution, what is your position? Let's have the freaking thing. Do you accept the prosecution assertion? I don't know. I can't do the thing. Could there be a hidden description in these two photograph prints somewhere? Before I give my answer, my lord, I'd like to try something if I may. Try something? What do you mean, counsel? I'll need to use a certain piece of evidence for the court record to identify the discrepancy. I'm not entirely sure I follow. Which piece of evidence do you attempt to use to help you identify the discrepancy between the two prints? Take that! I'd like to use this device, my lord. The two, v the two, v the v to view the two prints stereoscopically. Oh, yes, you caught the bug at last. You can resist it, can you? You've got the cross side compulsion. Jury number three, what a surprise. Come on, Runo. Let's put the pictures in place and see what this wonderful contraption shows us. There we go. Now look for the eyepiece. Hey, yo! I wasn't sure at first, but there's a clear discrepancy between the two prints. What? 
You must identify the location in question for the court council. And to the precise location the description in which you speak of. I just want to be exact. Granted, these two prints are almost identical. However, there is one minor discrepancy between them. What? Hey, it moved! When you view the two pieces stereoscopically... That's the box? A single area stands out as being different. The location of this small box. Let me wait. Unbelievable. All right, Jove, you're right. That was extraordinary. What this tells us is very simple. Mr. McGill's small box was indeed not stolen from the Winnie Bank on the night in question. However, there can be no doubt. That somebody picked up this particular box and then returned to its place on the shelves. Are you suggesting the small box originally deposited on Mr. McGill is in fact? Yes, the very small box I just identified in those photographic prints. Objection. Mindless guesswork. What if it was? So a box was moved on the shelf, nothing was stolen, which means quite simply that nothing has changed. That may be true, but. All right, my gilded box wasn't stolen then, but it doesn't fa it was moved like that to change things. It changes nothing. It changes everything. I believe this changes everything about the case. How can that possibly be? The crucial point is the fact that the what was moved was a small box. In other words, we have to consider what might have been inside that box. What are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that we need to examine that box as soon as possible. A vital piece of evidence is sitting on the shelves of the Winnie Bex as we speak. Not that won't be necessary. Some little box belonging to a man who died two months ago can't possibly be relevant to this trial. The court does not uphold your objection, Lord Von Zykes. Bailiff, arrange for an officer to go to the Baker Street at once. I'll turn a small box and bring it back here for our examination. To be continued, recess. Recess. A stare down. We should have a report within half an hour. I think perhaps we should recess for a short while until the evidence is brought forth. To be hoodwinked by such a farce. <laughs> Disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Von Zykes? This is nothing but a smokescreen. A Nipponi specialty, it would seem. What are you trying to say? My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the beginning. That this witness intent was to steal an article belonging to McGilded from the pawn brokery. Yet, common sense tells us that none of the articles are value enough to be worth stealing its first, first place. In the first place. Exactly! It would be beyond absurd to break into place for the purpose of stealing common property. If your lordship recalls, Mr. McGillick perished two months ago immediately after conclusions in his trial. A trial in which he was found not guilty. A trial in which was the salary was the upstanding member of society his reputation implied, in fact. So I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most insightful defense. The articles this upstanding member of society pawned were entirely ordinary. Of the black overcoat that just happened to have the music box, this is one of his pockets, and a small box. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if the man tried to make a gift of such things to me. You know, that does make rather a lot of my sense. Oh hell no, please no. Well you can deposit cash upon him, I'm quite certain of that. 
The prosecution's argument is undeniably compelling. It is un incumbent on the defenses now to bolster its argument. To explain what possible significance these commonplace articles upon whether fine citizens could have. Well, counsel, is your argument in fact demonstrable? Are you able to show proof that the disc or the box are intangible related to the case? Well... What's the matter, Runo? We know that they're related, don't we? They're both vital pieces of evidence. Yes, of course. You and I both know that. We know McGill's true character, and we know the disc is significant, even if we don't know why. But if we explain all the court at this point, we'll have to acknowledge that McGill's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. That the defense argument was flawed, and based on false information. Oh no! That would mean a meeting that Gina committed perjury. But Genie, could it be that Von Zyke knows? Is that why he's doing this now? Because he's anticipated everything? But maybe, this could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry, what do you mean, Iris? Well, what is it that you always say, Runo? Sooner or later, the truth comes out, every time. All right, the exact significance of the things that Megiddo deposited with Mr. Winning Banks is something that only Gina can explain to the court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about that, it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. What's the right thing to do here? Have her testify for the court! I don't know why I'm saving it. We're probably gonna get into part four in a bit. Testify for the court! My lord, the fans would like to make a proposal. Oh, what proposal, counsel? While the court awaits the arrival of Mr. McGiddle's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Ms. Gina Lestrade, to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's to do with the various articles deposited at the Windy Bakes by Mr. McGiddle, my lord. Ms. Lestrade has information relating to them. I believe it will be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. It will prove the significance of the articles in question once and for all. Well, well, things are becoming interesting. I presume you are considered the implications of the testimony you're proposing. In particular, the impact it will have on the accused's standing and indeed your own. I have. Lord Von Zarks, would you care to explain that last remark? The prosecution accepts the defense proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. Very well, if you have no objection. So, the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Miss Jean Lestrade. And with that, we'll end the episode right here. Like, comment, subscribe, share, guys.